Hello. I see myself. I'm on TV. Kevin, I'm on TV. I know. I see you. I'm very I think impressed I see with myself. Me too. Hey, you know, um, this morning I was down at the Liberty Hotel. Okay. And we're going to talk about Dracula tonight. We're continuing our Halloween series. We're going to talk about Dracula. And the Spanish and the English version are all in a combined The Legacy Collection, which I got out of the Winchester Public Library. Cool. Okay, so we got Vampy coming up tonight. But this morning at 10 o'clock, I interviewed Felicity Jones and her director from the film Like Crazy. I saw it last night at the screening at the Kendall. Mm -hmm. And I had my camera, but uh, the station's camera. But they didn't want us filming at the Kendall, so I had to go into town and interview them in the press room at the Liberty Hotel. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to play you that nine-minute interview from this morning. Very exciting. This film comes out November 4th. We have an exclusive here at WinCam and Worldwide on the Web. You're the only people to see this footage of uh, Felicity Jones, and they talk about the gory ending that they taped for Like Crazy, very Glenn Close, very Fatal Attraction, and then they pulled it out. Okay, so visual radio, Felicity Jones. Here we go. Hello. Hello. Like crazy. It was a very fun movie. When did the first idea start to gel for it? I think just uh, well, earlier last year I started thinking about relationships and sort of reflecting on some feelings and ideas about love and what it meant and what a long distance relationship is and, and how difficult it is to navigate. I was expecting uh, Anne Maria. Uh, Anna or Samantha to uh, go Glenn Close in the fatal attraction kind of mode when she had the knife in the apartment. Yeah, we shot that scene, but yeah, it, just, it, it was too gory. I did mean, you, did you really? Did actually slice off Jacob's head. She, no. It totally decapitates his head. That's You're good. kidding. That was the old ending. Yeah. You are joking. <laughs> I think we are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh. Did she, did she have any thoughts about going a little spazzy on him? Um, I don't think she wants to kill him at that point. She just wants to eat him. She's like a spider. <laughs> yeah. Don't know what that was. <laughs> um, does she want to? No, she's just really, she's just frustrated with their relationship. And gets angry. She didn't seem to be concerned about her promotion or her new boyfriend as much as uh, reworking the old relationship. Did you struggle with what you wanted for your character and what your character wanted? Uh, there's always a bit of a struggle as you're trying to work out who the character is, and um, and there's a side to Anna that is very impulsive, and and she doesn't necessarily think through everything. She makes dis she makes you know she acts on her feelings, and um, and sometimes that could be could be quite frustrating as someone who doesn't necessarily do that. Mm -hmm. There was an old song in the '70s, um, Maureen McGovern, "Torn Between Two Lovers," um, but Anna and Jacob seemed rather heartless, like they were renting. Simon and Samantha for the time in between. Like a movie, like a renting a movie. Did you get that? I think that I think they're both looking for people who are very different from from each other. And, and so for Anna, Simon is, is um she has a very different type of relationship with him. Uh, but it's hard because she's always drawn back to Jacob and, and that's something in her gut, you know, she can't help that. Uh, Drake, switching countries, boyfriends and girlfriends, was there a metaphor there when they were just going from America to London and switching people? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if a metaphor, but I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly difficult to be emotionally in two places at the same time. And I think that the movie really explores what it feels like to be torn in that sort of that gray area in between something. and, and um, yeah, just being in two places at the same time and how difficult that is. There was a scene with Anna in the, in the uh, is it Heathrow? Yeah. The airport. Yeah. And all those um, people shooting by like comets. Yeah. Was that the Canon 7 mm -hmm. camera? Mm -hmm. So yeah, did you take easy. stills? Uh, it's a time lapse. So we're taking a still every, uh, uh, we're taking one still a second for 30 minutes. And that's, that's, that's the time lapse. And how did you get all those people going by her? We rented them all. No, they were, they were all real people, just in the airport. The, the camera was so small and 
uh, inconspicuous, we were, we were able to kind of hide it behind a pole. So it's very difficult to tell that uh, they're being shot. So I think only one or two people looked into the camera. We only had to omit like one or two frames. And then, uh, and then everyone else is in. They're all real people. Now, we were at the Kendall last night where you did a Q&A, both of you, and it was great. Oh, thank you. Um, I didn't realize you, that there were nine years. Well, seven. there was seven, seven. seven. but then seven. really Sorry. we condensed it down. It's pretty, I kind of see it as five-year okay. journey now. <laughs> I almost would have liked if you had two, two and then one and then two. Okay. And I hope you don't mind me saying this. Scott, I would have told me that now. <laughs> if there was a little narration, all the signs, it might have made it easier for me because I didn't realize the time. Sure. That had passed. Sure. But yeah, I, I think if you if you think it takes place in three years or five years or seven years, I still think it has the same effect. Yeah. And that's what's exciting about it is you really you, you really do get to put your own sort of uh, time period on the film, and you have to you, you bring your own as the audience, you bring your own sensibilities of how much time has passed, which is really nice. And you don't need you don't need to. Make no, it's it's um you you know if you know specifically or too specifically, I think you're worrying about the wrong things as opposed to just following emotionally where the characters are and where they're dropped off when time has passed. Are you familiar with Quantum Leap? I am. I love that. She is. She loves it. Quantum Leap, that was my favorite show. I felt this film kind of had a romantic Quantum Leap. Oh, really? Sure. Going back, uh, you know, there I, was also... Did you ever see that show? Is that Scott Bakula? Yeah. yeah it was, was so good. It was so good. It. Sorry, I haven't thought about Quantum Leap for a long time. Well, your, your film did that to me, because when they're in the shower and they're flashing back, and there was so much flashing around and uh, time being condensed. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, The beach and the boats and the Ferris wheel seem to show young love. This is for either of you. Um, it seemed to fade away after all that fun frivolity as the movie got on. Did they get more involved with complexities of life? Uh, well, after that initial period. But when they first meet, they're just completely overwhelmed by each other and, and madly and passionately in love. And obviously, they don't really know each other at that point. It's just a love at first sight thing, and then gradually relationships shift and change as you get to know each other. I think they just grow up, and it's kind of sad, but they're, they're kids when they first meet, and then they're adults when, when, when she gets back. So it's, um, yeah, you lose a little bit of the innocence together yeah. as you grow apart and you grow up apart. Well, now that they've grown up and lost the innocence, will Simon and Jacob and Samantha and Anna get a sequel, a sort of modern day like Bob and... Like crazier in 10 years? We'll check in and see where they're at. No, more like Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. It was a film from the 60s. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> I'm, I just thought... I didn't understand why they didn't try to have some kind of an arrangement mm -hmm. with the new mates and the, and yeah, the yeah. old... I think, I think Simon and Samantha need to have like a, like a conference call to discuss a few things. Maybe they should get together. I think they should. They would look beautiful mm -hmm. together. They would. They would. Can you imagine? They would probably really be into each other. That is a lot of beauty. I think Simon would really be into Samantha, but I don't think Sam would really get Simon. No, she's, yeah. I think she's, she's a little, got her own, yeah. little bohemian for him. A little, yeah. But I they thought, look great. They look great in pictures. I thought they'd make a good couple, too. Uh, Anna, was she a generalization of young girls in love, or was she a unique, different, distinct woman? Going through this. Very unique and very special, and I think that's a tribute to so many elements of Felicity brought to the character. But I think she's she embodies a lot of youth and a lot of uh, elements that, that a lot of young ladies have. But at the same time, I think she's really uh, a special, and unique character. Lots of people have said that Anna reminds me of their first girlfriend. That's great. Well, then in that case, she's just a generic, <laughs> exactly. generic uh, young you lady. You know, cookie cutout character. Cookie, yeah, that's what she is. She could be in any film, any time. Any, yeah, we could pluck her, yeah, and then put her in a film in the 50s. Yeah, know? same, same one. Yeah, the poem would work. Yeah. They seem so normal, but then at some point they're unbalanced. Is it because of the obsession? They're yeah. just ordinary people other than the obsession? Yeah, absolutely. I think obsession is a is a major feature of their relationship and why they can't get away from each other. There is a, there's a level of something quite mad, I think, about yeah. the way they see each other. There's an obsession with a time and a place that, that, that is gone and that has passed. And they spend so much time trying to recreate that or feel that again. It's like an aphrodisiac in a way. Why didn't Anna get more advice from the parents funding her adventures? <laughs> why didn't you, oh, sorry? Why didn't more Anna get more advice? Ah, uh, well, she's a free spirit, you know. 
And she got that from her parents with their drinking uh, and... Well, they've given her you know, a lot of independence and then they've said, you know, go, go forward and, and be an independent young woman. And she does that. Well, I appreciate your time. Thanks for being on Visual Radio and, and much success with the film. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Felicity Jones back. and Drake from Like Crazy. Are you crazy? I'm, cr I'm always crazy. So the Usara people, yes, the gory ending where they cut off Anton Yeltsin's head, but they didn't use it in the final, in the final Play, cut. Final cut, thank you. I was trying to think of that song by that band from Europe, the final countdown, the final countdown, the final cut. Boom. My brain is like delayed reaction. Every week you get to see me slow, slowly lose my mind. I think we all lose our minds. So, uh, we got lots of fun stuff tonight. We could do a little bit of Sarah Kaloff in honor of Cal Halloween. Should we do that right now so we don't bother Joe and Jeff and... Uh, Anthony? You want to bring it up now? Um, yeah, so we don't bother you guys. All right, so tell them what it is. We're going, to do, we're going to do like just five minutes of my Sarah Karloff interview. It's a 29-minute interview, but from? it's from Portland, Maine, 2004. And Sarah Karloff is, of course, Boris Karloff's daughter. And in honor of Halloween, we got Vampy on later tonight. And we got Frank Delostrito, so we're having fun. This is Sarah Karloff. That's okay. That was Bobby Hebb in Boston around the same time. Yeah. I will find it. You're going to have to keep talking about it. But, you know, we don't have to play it tonight, but it would be fun. So, um, so what? When they find, um, so have you been to? I have been frazzled. I, I was running around all week. I've had a zillion things to do. All right, I got it. Stories I'm writing. Okay, I think there they got, got it. it. Yeah, they got it. Well, it, it's yeah. a wonderful opportunity for us. I really do like the exhibit that's here at the Portland Library. Ooh, we'll it's called Frankenstein Penetrating the Secrets of Nature. And it is um, dark, supported by the uh, National Library of Medicine and the uh, and National Endowment for the Humanities. It uh, wow. originally was at the National Library of Medicine in well, no, um, I have a Bethesda, Maryland writing. in 1997. It was there for 13 months, and then uh, it, is, uh, it got some camera, funding, yeah. and it is now touring 80 cities over a four-year period, and Portland, Maine is life. one of the cities that it's visiting. I That's like amazing. That. Will you go to some of the other cities, too? I've had an opportunity to visit yes, about so seven other cities so far. And before the, the uh, tour is finished at, uh, in the middle of uh, 2006, mm -hmm. I'll have an opportunity to visit about 10 or 12 more cities. It's a wonderful exhibit. It uses Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and uh, uh, the entire story as a hook to get uh, uh, people into libraries. Uh, to ponder some of the questions um, sociologically and theologically and medically to uh, have them think about some of the questions her story poses. And it brings people into libraries and uh, ha gets people to think about some of the questions society is, is, is presented with today. That's an important task, too, bringing people into libraries. I noticed I, I do a lot of research in libraries. People were drifting away from them. Then computers well, came in and people started coming back. Well, that's true. Uh, this this particular exhibit is is multi generational in its appeal. Um, it it um, it really captivates the imagination of young and old alike. It's an important exhibit, and I do hope people will come. If not, they don't have an opportunity to come here to the Portland uh, Portland Maine Library. I do hope they'll look on the internet. Uh, maybe visit our website at www.karloff.com and see where else this exhibit is, uh, uh, is going to be and visit this uh, one of the libraries that it's going to be appearing at. So you keep the updates on, the, on your web page? Yes, I do. 
Right. There's a beautiful photo of you there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Robert Barry Franco's in New York emailed and said, here's a picture of Sarah, and it was your website. Oh, well, that's very nice. We do have a website. Um, we try to keep it updated. Um, we ex we have a uh, one of the, uh, the pages on our website is an artist gallery. Um, we uh, exhibit the artwork of various Karloff artists, and we try to give them exposure for their art. Uh, that they might not get elsewhere. Um, and we have a tribute section where we uh, display the letters people have written me about my father. And we get some marvelous letters from people from all over the world uh, who just have written me just warm and wonderful things about my father. Um, and we have, um, we have a merchandise section where we display the merchandise of various licensees. Um, it's it's a fun web page. We try to make it fun for the fans of my father. Outside of him being such a great character in so many of these movies, he was a really great actor. Thank you. He he was. He really was. As I said earlier, he made 170 films. Um, he had an enormous body of radio work. He did about 20 children's albums. He appeared on Broadway in Arsenic and Old Lace. He was in Peter Pan. He was nominated for a Tony in, uh, opposite Julie Harris in The Lark. Um, and my roommate, Jeff Brown, wanted to tell you he saw your father in The Lark. Oh, His really? His grandmother took him. He was about eight or nine, and he loved it. Oh, it was a wonderful play, yeah. of We're course. We're going to talk to Kevin. Cool. So um, that was Sarah Karloff. That's Boris's daughter. I have two tapes. I had a two-camera shoot, and that was the dark camera with the great audio, and I never edited in the, uh, the, the light camera. The uh, hey Jeff, could you shut the door? Thanks, man. The uh, the there's a camera with more light. So Kevin, you have a haunted house in front of your house. Yes. And the police of Winchester come through it because they don't like no, it. No, no, no. Uh -huh. Um, my mom's my mom said, like a couple of their you know their um, kids want to go by and see it. So I mean that's what I heard from her. So I mean. My neighbors don't like it, that's for sure. Well, they'll get over it. How, how long did it take you to build it? I've seen it. it I've seen this, people. It's a, a in, pretty cool haunted house. Well, I started in, like, the end of September, and all I needed to do was put, like, mining things to it. But it was raining, and, you know, it's October, and a lot of stuff shouldn't be out at the night, at, you know, the night before, you know, at, right at Halloween, so. Your older brother, the Fonz, was here a couple of weeks back. Yeah. Where is he tonight? He's up in New York. Ah. <laughs> ah. He's up in New York. Our director, Jeff Dearman, was working with the Fonz, Henry Winkler. Henry Winkler? Harry Winkler. Henry Winkler. Uh, who was doing a Boston shoot. Ryan Reynolds was here. Uh, so Boston is the place to make movies. We're making movies. I think that we should do a WinCam movie festival. We're going to have Robert Newton from the Gloucester, the Gloucester, which is my, is that my camera? Does that look good? Yeah. No, yeah that's, okay. That's so the Gloucester uh, Town Theater up there, Robert Newton's going to be on here. He's a critic too, and he was at the Jodie Foster interview with me. So um, host Visual Radio Live. Hoorah. Yeah. Oh, you know, we get these cool magazines here, thanks to one of our board members, Don Daniel. Have you seen Imagine? So Rex Trailer, our guest Rex Trailer, is in this new issue of uh, Imagine magazine. It's all in blue, so it's September, the last issue. Okay, I just put these out. The last issue, September, the, the October. Kevin's got the October. So Rex Trailer, there's a big feel. article by Mike Bova. I have to send him an email and say, hey, Mike, I read your article. Rex Trailer, get your guns. There it is, people. Yeah, so that's in the September issue of Imagine. If you'd like a copy, just email us at visual underscore radio dot com. Nope, 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 nope. Visual underscore radio at yahoo dot com. If that's too hard to remember, record review 2001 at Yahoo. That's where I do all my record review writing. Record review, record review 2001 at Yahoo, and I'll send you a free copy of Imagine Magazine. 
We've got books we give away. We've got CDs. And so you can just send an email and say, hey, I want a free book. I want a free CD. And I want a free Imagine Magazine. We got the stuff. You know what I say about free? What? Everything's better when it's free. Well, if you appreciate things, if you appreciate things that are free, we're a TV I show, a free and we have free magazines, and it's worth picking up on. You have what? I had a couple of things, you know, especially when it's when it comes down to food. Free yep. is good with food. Trust me when I it say is. that. I got free food. Your camera is like weird. Ah, there you go. See, now you're looking at it. Wait, which one's my camera now? Ah, uh, now my camera's on. Yeah. This is uh, Cinema Verite tonight. <phone rings> You've been visualized. Hello? Is Vampy there? Oh, hi. Hey, Vampy, welcome to Visual Radio. <laughs> That's right. We had planned this. That's right. It's Friday, isn't it? It's Thursday. We changed the show to Thursday nights. Okay. But you're out on the West Coast. We're talking to Vampy, Gothic artist. It's 821 here. It's 521 out there. How are you, Vamp? Oh, not good. I'm waiting to record the drum track because my drummer's going on tour on the 23rd. Who is he touring with? Uh, Vicious Rumors. They're going to be gone for seven weeks. And uh, they're opening for Hammerfall, and <gasps> they're just going to, like, everywhere. So I got to wait. <laughs> My co-host, Kevin Russo, was just, uh, he likes Hammerfall. Oh, really? Yeah, good band. Yeah, they're pretty, I, I was just starting to get into them because I, I knew Vicious Rumors, and uh, uh, then they got added on to the full tour. They were just doing half of it, and so um, my recording drummer's gone. Yeah. For a while. And you don't want to use drum beats, right? Lindrum syndrome. No, uh, he, I did a really good take with him. Uh, well, actually, like ten of them, and he said he'll come back and do something even darker, which I think I take him up on. And uh, what he did was really good, but I'm just trying to really get it dialed in perfect. So, did you do knock knock, um, knock knock at the night yet? That's the song we're still working on. Uh, it, I'm just, I'm trying to fit in this, like, uh, heavy metals has gotten so many different genres lately, uh, that you really have to have a specific, like, beat, and you have to have a specific, um, uh, lyrical content and, and look and everything, it's it just, uh, it's really grown, and so, um, that's what I'm going for, and I just, I'm just, uh, I put so much work into it that I just might as well wait a little bit longer. So, Vampy, I'm holding in my hand. The uh, Legacy Collection of Dracula. Uh huh. Have you seen it? Uh, was that the one we were talking about before? The the move, all the old, the, the the first movies. Yeah, the original score, then the Philip Glass score, then the uh, Stephen Summers on Universal's classic monster Dracula, and a documentary on the road to Dracula, a theatrical trailer, feature commentary. Then there's Dracula, the Spanish version, Dracula's daughter. Son of Dracula and House of Dracula. Yes, I did see that. It's pretty amazing. It's basically uh, two discs plus you flip one disc over. The documentary part's really good. Yeah, and you, you really get to find out a lot of stuff, how they, they filmed everything. And uh, Gee, when, when I talk about it, I sound like an expert. I just got it off of that. You know? <laughs> it was, how is my it, it's it's uh, um, amazing how before they did dubbing that, that they were actually had two full crews actually doing that same movie. Well, you know, I, I just love, I adore the thought. Um, these aren't public domain, though, are they? No, universal stuff, I believe, is, no. no. Yeah, right, because, man, it would be fun in 10 years to just cut and paste and make your own long version of Dracula. Taking some of the scenes from the Spanish movie and adding them to the English version. Yeah. Even, the, you know, when, when Jonathan, when uh, Renfield, Renfield is at Castle Dracula, the Spanish version, the door is creepier, it's better lit, and uh, you could take that whole segment and just insert it, and it would make, it just create the Lugosi version would just be so much more spooky. 
Well, I thought the coming down the stairway version uh, on the Spanish one that he's coming down the stairway is better. And uh, when he met, they met in the opera thing. That was really kind of clumsy uh, in the original version. And right. The Spanish version was better. Uh, there, there's a lot of improvements in it. It's just the acting wasn't as good for the Dracula. There's some of the improvements aren't as good as the Todd Browning Dracula, but many are. So there are there are pluses to each film. Mm -hmm. And you're right, the acting is superior in the Edward Van Sloan. How can you come close to him? Such a great character actor as Van Helsing. Yeah, is that who that was? Yeah, Edward Van Sloan. He was also in the Dracula's Daughter. But he, if you go on IMDb, he's a Internet Movie Database. He is in a lot of old films. He's a very well-known actor from that time period. Very good. So uh, we hope to get more horror movie reviews from you, Vampy. <laughs> I was supposed to, like, this is the worst October. I'm supposed to uh, get this thing wired over to, to a local TV station. Uh, that hasn't happened, and... Nobody likes physical packages anymore. And, you know, it's just, um, you know, I'm just, uh, it was, it's been a very bad month. I mean, I really, I'm really depressed because this is like my best month of the year and nothing is happening. Oh, well, you know, yeah, it's, it's Halloween. We've been interviewing a lot of people. We just played a little Sarah Karloff. I interviewed her in 2004. Uh -huh. So before we called you, we, we put a little of her on. I'll send that out to you. I'll send you a DVD or I'll email you a link. Okay. But I'll send you a DVD, too. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you, are you going to do anything for Halloween? Um, my guitar player was doing, like, a murder ballad, uh, ballad thing in Berkeley, but um, I don't know. I'm murder out. ballad? Yeah, everybody does murder, murder songs and throws blood around and stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's the goth club you hang out at. Um, I might go to there. I'm, oh, there, there's a couple of those. Um, my, my favorite one got closed down, but there's um, no new back cave one, and there's a uh, uh, I think dancing ghosts or something like that. I gotta try. What was the one that got closed down? Oh, that was the house of voodoo. What happened to it? Um, well, I think he um, the the guy that was running that got a divorce. Oh, that'll do it. Yeah, and so everything gets changed after a divorce, and, and so it really wasn't the club thing, I don't think it was, you know. And uh, that was, oh, that was supposed to be my debut show, but I just never got anything together for it. <laughs> but um, I, I got some other things lined up when I do get the songs together. It's just so long in production with, with everything. I know. Well, you know, this show's here every week, so, you know, we want to have you back and talk to you more and, and get us some updates. And, you know, you can feel free to call in, you know, every other week and give us an update on whatever goth films are out there that we should know about. In fact, let's correspond about that more if you're up for it. Okay, yeah. Right now I'm doing my own little uh, personal battle, you know, Vampy versus Godzilla. He's got a, he, he's, he works for an insurance company now and he's got a British accent. <laughs> but um, um, he doesn't want to pay for stepping in my face. Well. But <laughs> everything else is going very well. Well, I'm going to keep you posted on what we're doing, and if you want to join in on the fun, you can. How's that? Sounds good. Happy Halloween, Vampy. Happy Halloween. Thanks, man. Happy Halloween. All right. Bye-bye. He was in a low-energy mood tonight. What mm -hmm. is it? I think he forgot we were doing an interview. Well, I think, huh? he, I think it's Halloween, and I think, you know. People are just, but I'm all up. I'm having fun. There's a yeah. lot of fun stuff happening. You know, the, the, the TV show's going great. We're having so much fun here. I um, definitely like to uh, go into that uh, new haunted house that they're doing in Fenway Park. Take, uh, see if you can take the video camera. I, you know, I, I would, you know, if, well, it depends on the haunted house, you know. We were emailing Saturday night, right? Were we talking on email? Because I went to see the thing. Oh, yeah, you told me that. How was that? You know... I'm not a big fan of the thing to begin with. Okay. Uh, so, you know, the same old claustrophobic. Uh, first, the, the 1950s one was in the Arctic. Now the, um, uh, that one from, John, was it John Carpenter? It was mm -hmm. Wilfred Brimley was in it with, um, 
oh, who's that guy? He was in the Air, not Air Force One. He was in that hijack movie. Um, it was Wilford Brimley's movie. This is a prequel to that. Hmm. It's gorgeous filming. So the filming is beautiful. You go down to Antarctica. Uh, the girl is made to look like she's going to be the new Sigourney Weaver. And the monster was like, if you ever saw the Horta from Star Trek number 25, the, uh, the thing that had the, sil the silicon eggs all over. Do you watch Star Trek? Oh, I'm Remember the Horta? Thing. Yep. <laughs> all right, so this thing looks like the Horta. Oh, God. Uh, and it eats people. So, I thought you know, it hides inside of them. Huh? I, I thought they hide inside of them. They do that, too. So they do it like Alien. It's, it's a mix of Alien, but um, if the full creature's out there, it'll eat you. Uh, and if not, it hides inside you, and it does both. And Okay, it was fine for a night's entertainment. I don't think I'll be watching it on cable. You know, Runaway Jury is a movie I really like. It was on again last night, and there's all these new shows, and I'm like, I'm back to Runaway Jury. If the actors do a great job, I'll study it. I'll study it 50, 60, 70 viewings. You know, um, I do, I do want to see uh, the Paranormal Three. Is that activity. a new movie? Yeah, it's Paranormal Activity Three. It's actually, if you watch uh, the Paranormal and Paranormal Two, mm -hmm. it it actually takes back and play it like before the Paranormal. Um, You're into all this ghost stuff. I I really am. Like it's very interesting what you know, what actually happens and how, you know, things go bump in the night, and I think it's pretty cool. This is a new way of doing visual radio by profile. Profile. We're being profile. Profiles encourage. Kevin Russo, co-host, local film critic. It's the paranormal revenge on visual radio. Uh, on so, Halloween. Yeah, so... You've built your ghost house. I've been in my Dracula yeah. phase. I've just been studying <laughs> the Dracula films. And I'm very excited by this thing. From the Winchester Library, the Dracula collection, which I'll probably bring back tomorrow. Because cool. if you don't bring them back, it's two bucks a day, fine. How many days do you get? Do you get one day? Do you get two? I forget. I don't even know. Probably one. I, I bet, you well, know. Well, how long is the movie? Th there's like, there's a bunch of movies here. I know, but how long are each of them? Um, an hour. It depends. It's an hours and hours movie. In fact, I watched then these it depends, on YouTube. Then it depends on the, um, like, you could probably get, like, a, two weeks out of that. Oh, hopefully. Because it's such a long thing, you know. So. What's so fascinating is uh, um, yeah. Universal made so much money on these Dracula movies. They could have done a, a much better job keeping the thing going. They veered off into weird directions. Uh, had they just kept Lugosi in there as the Dracula and did 10 movies, he would have had a happier life. They would have made a lot more money, but yeah. they did silly things. Mm. It's, it's so <laughs> obvious. This is, this is the motion picture that kept you in the black that year. And to drop the ball like that is just, it's illogical. But we live in an illogical world, as you know. There's very little logic to what happens here. Here in visual radio, there's lots of logic. But out there in the real world, the real world is illogical. We are the logical ones. Hey, so, there's my new uh, logo for you. So I want to do uh, uh, WinCam film, film Festival. So all you WinCam filmmakers, of which Kevin's one, I'm one, Joe LaRock is a filmmaker. I think Jeff Dearman's making a film, our director tonight. Uh, Andrew Rotondi's ma making one. Todd Rotondi's making a new one he can't even talk about. I think we should have a Windcam Film Festival, maybe at the Jenks Center, maybe at one of the theaters somewhere. Maybe we'll go up to the Gloucester Theater. Oh, that's a bit of a hike. Uh, I'm working on a bunch of films right now. So that's just an idea. I think I'll send some email out and see if we can gather together a little film festival. You know I'm involved in making The Count. So I'm working on the script. And I talked to Lisa Cavanaugh last night, film actress from Los Angeles. 
She is back here in Boston. She was co-host of this show back in 96. So Lisa said she would absolutely participate in some of the shooting of For the Count movie. So Lisa's on board. I'm going to ask my friend Jape. And we're going to have a real movie in a couple of weeks. We'll have it wrapped up by November. What do you think of that? Fun. You're going to help me edit? Sure. <laughs> I put them on the spot. Help me edit. Uh, well, yeah. Should we call Buzzy Linhart and see what he's up to? Okay. Let's see what it's up Buzzy to you. Up to. It's your show. It's not my show. It's our show. You're my co-host. <phone rings> Two ringy dingies. That plant needs water. That's a fake plant. Man. It's a fake plant? Actually, no. Sorry. That's a real plant. Joe LaRocca has a fake I, show. No. No. Yeah. The wonderful show is Hi, a fake show. Oh, Buzzy knows who we are. Are we on the air? We're on the air. What are we, what are we, what are we doing on the air today, Joe? We just had Vampy on. Vampy? How was he feeling? He was down. His energy was down. We've had an earthquake here today. Quite an earthquake, did well, you know? You did? Kevin's going to ask you. Yell. He would not Say you did. You did? Very, quite an earthquake here, very big. Or not a lot of injury, but 3.9, and it was a little scary. I don't know if he uh, was thinking of it consciously, but it's uh, sad and dark. Did the lights go out? Did your lights go out? No. Oh. Did any books fall? No books fell, but... Uh, it, it was big enough to uh, make us think. Um, I'm going to turn this TV off. Lawrence O'Donnell. Buzzy Linhart is on the phone. He's watching Lawrence O'Donnell, but he's on visual radio. That yeah. is... It's we want to be on the radio for the visual. Ah. Guys, what happened on the East Coast today? Uh, on the East Coast, I interviewed uh, Felicia Jones from um, this new movie, Like Crazy. I see. She's like, that you're is. crazy. <laughs> it, what's it called again, please? Like crazy. Like crazy. Who's in that? Anton Yeltsin from, uh, Yelchin from Star Trek. Uh-huh. And he, uh, they're 19-year-olds, and they fall madly in love, and they play footsie, and they go to the beach, Aww. and then she <laughs> overstays her visa which causes problems for them for years. So he's in America, she's in England. They try to get back to each other. And meanwhile, they have their affairs, you know? And it's, it's rather compelling. They did it uh -huh. on a quarter of a million bucks, Buzzy. Uh-huh. They shot it in 22 days on a quarter of a million bucks in Los Angeles. Isn't that great? You know, we got to get you in some of these movies. we got to, like, watch the variety when they're shooting films and get your voice in. You're so important. I think. I'd sure love to work. Thanks, Joe. It would be nice. Now I'm going to make you smile. I told you that Gilbert Gottfried, uh, there's 800 hits for my full interview. Yes. There's 500 for yours. Yes. But we also put you and Gilbert up on Jeff Master Birdie's site, and that's hit 500 on its own. Wow. So I talked to Art today. Did you know that? I asked him to please call you. We oh. were excited uh, because we're getting so close here now. Well, we, we, we had a nice chat, and I told him about the Gallagher and the, the Gilbert Gottfried, and you're getting so many hits, so we're going to do a medley of electric. Um, uh, Buzzy Lynn Hart presents Electric Lady Dream. We're going to have a medley of maybe six songs for the YouTube. Is that cool? Uh, like um, part, parts of them? Yeah, just so that, you know, there's like 20 seconds here, 30 seconds there, drifting uh, in and out so people get a montage that's a good idea, Joe. Art loved it. And so, um, you know, maybe we'll have the album cover up. Uh, maybe we'll have a photo of Jimmy. I don't know. Uh, you and I will talk about it off the air. Okay. But we just wanted to call and wish you a happy pre-Halloween. Uh, I know. How long? Mm -hmm. you have? It's 10 days now, right? Today's the 20th. It's 11 days away. This is Halloween. Uh, this is going to be the best Halloween ever. 
Well, the Dracula is in the air. And, uh... Dracula is in the air. I just wanted to say hi tonight. We're going to... We got a, a book man. review to do. No, no, a film review. The Terror. Boris Karloff's The Terror is coming up next. Uh-huh. But we wanted to say hi. We had a little time to call you. Thank you, everybody. No problem. Uh, there was something came through my brain. Oh, uh, upstairs neighbor who's a um, very accomplished uh, uh, cameraman. Uh, all the uh, new shots that they had, they had to, when they re re released the exile on Main Street for the stuff. Oops, are you there? Yeah. Uh, they had to go back over to uh, the mansion in France to get inserts because, you know, they were just taking incidental shots back then, but they wanted to get, uh, they had to, they read this, the same kind of, uh, of uh, moving film camera, and they took shots down the halls and uh, shots with reels turning around and stuff that they didn't get originally. Wow. They had to be matched to the original. It's just brilliant. But uh, John upstairs, whose name I can't pronounce, uh, did the camera work on it and is, uh, writes and produces his own stuff. He's uh, one of the people on the board of uh, uh, judging the Academy Awards for documentaries this year, and he brought eight great films down to me, all docs, they call them, documentaries. And he left me eight docs, including The Union, uh, Elton John uh, was listening to his old musical collections and came across uh, Leon Russell's early work and broke into tears and remembered how Leon was his hero back then before his career got so big, or both theirs, and called him up and said, let's make a record. And like two weeks into it, Leon had to take 10 days off for a five-hour brain operation something went wrong and he came back two days after and uh i'm halfway through it it's so great if you haven't heard the music they're t they've been touring uh, just recently they did the practice in medford mass in my hometown a mile from my house they had a very secret practice wow can okay. you believe that i should I'm, send you the I'm link really good if you want to remember why music back then was so uh so much more special than it's become this um, over over quoting by uh, sampling too much it's time for people to create new stuff to sample well an electric lady dream might have new stuff for people to re-explore i'm sure hoping so all right buzzy linhart we'll talk soon Thank you, Joe Vig. Thank you. Happy Visual Halloween. Radio in Wincam, Massachusetts. And Kevin Russo says hi. Hi, Kevin. Hi. How are you feeling? Good. Outstanding. All right, Buzz. See, See you, you at the Dream Picnic, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you for calling. Bye-bye, everybody. You're welcome. <laughs> That's Who's cool, that? huh? Who's we have, that? Huh? Who is that? Buzzy Linhart's a comedian. He was on Bill Cosby's Cause Show. Oh, really? Cool. Yeah. Cool. He's an old friend of mine, so um, we, we call him just to have fun and add some spice to our show. And On Thursday nights, Buzzy and I had a full show here at Wincam, uh, but I don't know if I have the strength so, to bring it back. So where, where is he from? Berkeley, California. Oh. He used by way of Greenwich Village. He was one of the Greenwich Village hippies there with Bob Dylan and Jimi Hendrix. and They all came out of the same scene. Moogie Klingman. I've got to have Moogie on the show. Anyway, uh, we're having fun here tonight. It's just, I just want to have a laid back show tonight and have some fun. And I'm glad you made it out here, Kevin. Get you into the dream picnic of visual radio. Oh, what happened? How did that happen? How did that happen? It's, right. it's October. Anything could happen. All sorts of weird stuff is happening. I've got to say that. Uh, all sorts of weird stuff is happening. Yeah, because it's October. I'm very su superstitious. Well, stuff happened with my phone and with my car. Just electronic stuff. Weird. It's Frank Delastrio. I'm talking about the movie. Hey, Frank, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good. I just called you and it just vanished on us, so the ghost of Dracula is in the phone. Well, it is Ben Lugosi's birthday. 
Today? Today. And we're 129 years ago he was born. 129 years old. God bless him. Yep. The old Count. That's He's immortal. Oh, actually, Count Dracula was at least four times old. Well, he's still alive. So, uh, we'll hang out on that. Anyway, tonight's movie is a terror, right? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, and uh, you want to talk about it, or you got something else you want to say first? What I wanted to say to you was, for a man who's lived only one life, Frank, you are very wise. Okay. Actually, it's not, <laughs> uh, the quote is not even a single lifetime. Ah. So, uh, but I guess that's only something an undead person can point out. You're not dead yet. So. I paraphrase, Bela. Yeah. <laughs> okay, The Terror, 1963. Uh, directed by Roger Corman, and it's made during a very prolific period in Corman's years. Uh, Star Boris Karloff and a uh, young Jack Nicholson. Boris Karloff is 76. Jack Nicholson is not yet 30 in this movie. And a lot of movies like this, it's hard to find out some of the details behind the scenes, but this movie's details have been out there from the beginning. And the story goes, which I, I believe is true, that they, that Corman and his company had just finished filming The Raven, and with Peter Bry, uh, Peter, uh, excuse me, Peter Lorre, Vincent Price, and their contracts were up, but his contract with Karloff gave him three more days, which he had paid for. He had three days of rental space in a studio, and he was determined not to waste it. And so he threw together a plot, threw together a story, filmed all of Karloff's scenes in those few days. And then he sent Nicholson and uh, the assistant director, who was Francis Ford Coppola, off to film whatever they had to film to fill in the gaps. And the result is the terror. And there are some scenes, particularly in the beginning, that have a wonderful haunting quality to them. Uh, they, the movie as a whole is a bit disjoint, and, and for the reasons I just described, they, they filmed uh, three days in a hurry, and then they, they filled in as best they could after that, making, uh, making up a script as they went along. But the scenes which I suspect were directed by Coppola in the beginning by the seaside uh, on the shore uh, have, a, have a very beautiful quality to them, the dreamlike, uh, quite unique. And, uh, again, I don't, I don't know if Corman filmed those. Actually, Jack Nicholson supposedly directed some scenes. Uh, Low-budget filmmaking, it's kind of everybody does what everybody has to to get it done. So I don't know who exactly filmed them, but they're, they're, quite, they're quite lovely, uh, quite effective. Uh, the rest of the movie doesn't keep up that pace, but the movie holds together. It's credible. It gets from point A to point B. And, uh, and the rest was history. Uh, the terror... It was, was filmed between pole movies. Uh, Corman was making mainly Vincent Price, Edgar Allan Poe vehicles. Which I, uh, I loved going to see yeah. back in the day. Yes, and they, uh, yeah, they, they're, they're, it's a wonderful set of them. And uh, I, I enjoy them. They're very enjoyable. This one fits in nicely. I mean, Boris Karloff's role could have been played by Vincent Price, except he had, uh, Corman had three days of uh, Price's uh, excuse me, Karloff's time paid for, so he was going to use it. So they, and it could have, you know, could have been claimed to come from a Poe story. You know, most of these f f films that claim they were inspired by Edgar Allan Poe have a pretty tenuous connection to the original, and they, so they could have come up with something. But this is this is not a bad movie. Is it in any way related to Poe? Do you think? Oh yeah, I mean you, I mean there's the there's the obsession with a lost love. There's a little psycho twist, I mean Psycho with a capital P because of, of the movie, Right. where one character, I won't spoil it for anybody, but one character we find out has uh, multiple personalities in the movie, but it, you know, it's got a very, a very, it's got a Poe atmosphere, the, you know, the gothic trappings, uh, the lost love, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of tragic air that hangs over Poe, that, that hangs over it well here. Uh, the leading lady was Sandra Knight. And she, at the time, was Mrs. Jack Nicholson. I think that is Nicholson's only time he married. Wow. Like George, like George Clooney, he discovered early in life he just wasn't the <coughs> marrying kind. And, it's better uh, on the wallet, too, if you're a yeah. film actor. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's true. And Sandra Knight and Jack Nicholson are basically supporting themselves at this time as TV actors. If you look at their credits, uh, Nicholson's got some feature films in there. Most of them with Corman. He was Corman had kind of a repertoire company, and uh, 
but he was, you know, it would be a few years before he he broke through when he he went right from this movie, which he's he's got a big role. He's got by far the biggest role, and he's quite good in it. Uh, not, you know, not not the, the great actor he would become, but he's obviously a man learning his craft. And but he had he had some he had some rough years ahead of him. He was back to television or whatever until uh, late '60s when uh, Five Easy Pieces, Easy Rider, movies like that kind of made his name, and then then he became a big big star in the '70s. For Sandra Knight in a dark movie, that would make her the original Dark Knight. That might make her the original Dark Knight, and and of course Jack Nicholson played the Joker. So. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Hey, very good. It comes around in a circle, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> well, I, I didn't think of the Poe connection, but you're absolutely right. Uh, Roger Corman was involved in these Poe movies, which were really wonderful. Uh, the Mask of the Red Death. What beautiful sets for low budget, don't you think? Yeah. Uh, by, by 1964, The Mask of the Red Death and The Tomb of Ligeia, mm -hmm. which for me is the prize of the Corman Price Poe movies, but everybody has their favorite. Uh, they were actually filmed in England, and they had a bigger budget. So uh, movies like this, the, I, I think the budget was really constrained. Most of Roger Corman's uh, movies up until like the mid-60s had really constrained budget. He was never a big budget movie maker, but he was, you know, he was really a uh, the, the poverty role puts them down. They were above Poverty Row, but they weren't they weren't A or even B budgets by any means. Uh, let's see, the the movie was written by a person you probably when I say Leo Gordon, you you probably you and most of your viewers would say, Well who's that? And if I showed you a picture of him, you'd say I've seen him a hundred times. He usually plays thugs, gangsters, uh, bad guys in Westerns. But he uh, he wrote the script uh, he did and he he was also part of the uh, Roger Corman repertory company. And he appeared in a lot of Roger Corman movies. The last one I think he appeared in of Roger Corman's was uh, St. Valentine's Day Massacre. But he he wrote a he wrote a lot of screenplays. And I when I looked when I saw his name on the credits, I looked them up, and I I didn't realize how many screenplays he had written. He wrote a lot of television. He wrote a number of Corman's uh, early cheaper films. So again, you know these these companies and Corman kept the same people with him. I think that was one of his strengths. Uh, the, everybody had to do what they had to do. The, the thing was, you had to make the movie, you have so much time, so much money, and no time to fool around. So if somebody who doesn't usually write scripts has to write them, that's, that's that. Um, we got to get Roger Corman on the show. Uh, that's doable. I don't know where he lives now. I guess he's out on the West Coast. I, I, I don't know what he's up to. He came through Boston, and I missed him. We had a film society here, and he was at there, and, you know, it's one of those things that slipped through the cracks. Can't tape everyone, you know? Yeah. There's only so many hours in the day. I guess he's 75, 76, but he's always looked very fit to me. So uh, that, that's doable. And the other, the other member of the uh, Roger Corman company that, again, if I say his name, a lot of people say, I don't know who that is, but when I show you the picture, they say, yeah, because he was in so many low-budget movies, and that was Dick Miller, who is still with us. He's in his 80s now, I guess, but he... Uh, he, uh, let's see, he's the gun dealer in the Terminator that, that, uh, oh. Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think he, I think he claims that he has the claim to be Arnold, Sh the Terminator's first victim, but he was in just dozens of these, these low budget movies and he's kind of a cult figure now because he was around so long in them. And, uh, let's see, my favorite with him is, uh, the name's escaping me, I'm getting old, Joe, uh. Oh, we got 60 seconds left, too, Frank. I got 60 seconds now, and now I'm under pressure like that. Anyway, what's, what, what's next week's movie? Um, I will email you. Uh, it'll be a Lugosi film again. Okay. So, oh, too bad we couldn't do it tonight, because we couldn't talk about his birthday and all that. But, oh, a bucket of blood. Dick Miller and a bucket of blood is really a joy to behold. So I recommend it. Uh, so if they'll go see a movie next week, you let me know which one. My guess it'll be one of the monograms you showed. Uh... Yeah, we could do White Zombie. We haven't done that, right? Oh, do want to do the... oh what did you want to do? You want to do the Bowery Boys, or? Uh, yeah, I like you to pick. It challenges me. I was, I was kind of oh. getting up for uh, Ben Lugosi beats a Brooklyn Gorilla. Brooklyn Gorilla, we'll do that. All right, if you can... next week. Okay, let me know if you have to change that life. And All right. You got to go, right? Yep, thanks, man. Okay, talk to you soon. Bye-bye. All right, Frank. Frank Delastrito, thank you for coming to the show tonight, Kevin. No problem. Did you have fun? Yeah. Did we lift up your spirits? We lift up vampies. We lifted up buzzies. They had an earthquake. We didn't. Um, boy, it's been a whirlwind week. We've done a lot of TV. I've done a lot of TV, Kevin. 
Uh, Charles Bracelin Flood is now up on YouTube. You can Google it. We just put that up about an hour ago. And uh, there's a lot more tape that I have. Oh, and I interviewed Zachary Quinto from Star Trek. So two Star Trek connect connections with an online interview yesterday.